Hello and welcome to Dead Creepy Podcast. You are listening to me, Claire Barrand, and my sister and co-host, Lindsay Smith. Hello, Lindsay. Hello. And yes, don't forget, you can also catch us on iTunes, Podbean, and YouTube. And contact us via our Facebook page or Twitter account. We love hearing from you, so get in touch. All on this week's show, we have Power News where we bring you the latest gossip in the paranormal field. And we also have Parapaddy, where we can report on who has kicked off this week on social media. And um, yeah, we've also got Skeptics View, of course, where we will speak to our resident parapsychologist, Daryl Whitebottom. And we're going to get his thoughts on the haunted doll story that's sweeping the world at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we also have a few creepy ghost stories to end the show with, so don't miss those. That's right. And oh, before we start the show, um, we have had a Facebook message from one of our listeners um, and her name is Mefanwi and she lives in Llanfairpul Gwyngil, Gogerich, Gwyndroboch, Llantili Silio Gogogoch. And she has asked... Yeah, go for it. Llanfairpul Gwyngil, Gogerich, Gwyndroboch, Llantili Gogogoch. Right, wow. And she's asked us for some more true Welsh ghost stories. Um, and, well, Mathanwi, you're in for a treat because if you keep tuned at the end of our show today, we've got an exclusive, um, and it's a true story written um, by a guy called Peter Glynn, and it's a story from the North Wales Asylum. So stay tuned for that. Ooh. Um, we also have had a ghost story sent to us from a listener called Tim from Aguaching. Oh, right. Aguaching, am I saying that right? In Minnesota. Oh, I don't know. Is that how you. Aguaching. Aguaching, Aguaching. Minnesota. Minnesota. Mm, do you think that's the right. Well, maybe we should Google how if we pronounce that properly. What do you think? Maybe um, we should. Don't want to get it wrong. Let's have a look. <laughs> oh. Okay, I wasn't singing it. That's that's why you're going wrong. Aquaching. <laughs> Aquaching oh, Minnesota. Right, right, okay. So what did Tim have to say? Right. Well he says Here we go. I have worked in some pretty spooky places over the years. Abandoned buildings, cemeteries, hospitals, etc. Of all the strange things I have seen and heard on the job, I have only seen a few things that I couldn't explain away. Being born on Halloween, I've always had a fascination with ghosts and things that go bump in the night. But I have yet to see or hear what I could say was a ghost. It's not that I haven't tried. I often brought my tape recorder along to see if I could record some ghostly voices. I listened to many hours of tapes from mausoleums, grave sites, el- empty buildings, etc. But I've never heard anything unusual. One mm. unexplainable thing did happen to me at the Aguaching State Hospital. Minnesota. By Walker, MN. Aguaching was built over a hundred years ago as a tuberculosis sanatorium. Ah, that, that consumption has cropped up again. Oh, yeah, yeah. The alcoholic. <laughs> yeah. It must have been an early AA clinic. Yes, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can't laugh now because of the next slide. Okay. Right. Okay. Many people died there, and at one point, the faculty had its own cemetery. In its final years, AGCC was a secure nursing home. (laughs) 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 So, 
in its final years, Agua Ching was a secure nursing home for inmates too old or sick to keep in the regular prison system. The nurses and the other security officers who worked at Agua Ching <laughs> all claimed yeah. all claimed to have seen or heard ghosts or other strange <laughs> things while working there. Almost every security officer has heard children playing in the hallway outside the security office, or there mm. have been no children there for years. I've never seen or heard anything like that while I worked there. Across the mm. security office, oh, across from the security office was a painting that gave us all the creeps. The painting was done as part of a WPA art project in the 1920s, when Agua Ching... <laughs> was torn down out of over a hundred paintings and artworks claimed by the Minnesota Historical Society this painting was the only one they left behind one of my mm. officers took a picture of this painting with his cell phone and emailed it to a lady friend of his mm. Rom romance isn't dead is it no <laughs> <laughs> After his friend took the picture, her cell phone died. Ooh. To this day, she blames him for destroying her cell phone. Well, I hope he bought her a new one. I bet that's what she was angling for. Mm -hmm. um, on the third night, I was sitting at the guard desk updating my report when the tennis racket... Oh, hang on. I've completely missed a section. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really important section, too. Yeah. Okay. Right, about <laughs> about three years ago, I was working a four-night four stretch at Agua <laughs> At that time, we were down to about 50 patients, and most of the 16 buildings were empty. On the first night, the nursing supervisor asked me to kill several bats. Yeah. That oh. were flying around the main hallway. That's not very nice. No. I don't like that. Okay, but I he did, was asked to do it. Yeah, well, yeah. I dispatched the bats with a tennis racket. When I returned to the security office, I stood the tennis racket up in a chair in front of our desk. Mm. On the third night, I was sitting at the guard desk updating my report when the tennis racket flew. Oh, no, hang on. It fell. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> I kind of over-dramatised it a bit there. It okay. fell out of the chair and skidded across the security office floor into the hallway. Yeah. Stopping under the creepy picture. Ooh. I picked the tennis racket up and laid it on the desk. At first, I didn't think much of it because it wouldn't take much to knock a tennis racket over. Later mm. that night, I tried to duplicate what happened for the nursing supervisor. It wasn't hard to make the tennis racket fall over. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I'm not. Oh, God, dear. this is a nightmare. It wasn't hard <laughs> to make the tennis racket fall over, but I was unable to get it to skid four feet across the floor into the hallway, no matter how I tried. Was this the work of a mischievous spirit? Maybe. Mm, wow. This is a well, good story, thank you. That. It is a great story, and, and thank you for sending that in, Tim. Because, it, you know, it's great to hear from mm. listeners, um, you know, yeah, it could have been it could have been a ghost. And, yeah. Um, interesting that they left that one painting behind. And I'd like to why. see a picture of that. He has, he has actually sent it, so mm. I will put that up on our Facebook page. Oh, it, fabulous, I must admit, yeah. it's creepy. What's it it is creepy. It's dead creepy. It's a man sort of holding a baby, but it, yeah, it's creepy. Mm. Mm. Anyway, shall we move on to Power News? Go on then. Power News. Right, well, this week in Power News, um, there's been a Liverpool um, ghost hunters um, company who claim to have captured the moment that the spirit of an ancient Egyptian priest Ness Yamun returning to his casket at a museum. Oh. Uh, so a, cu a couple, uh, ghost hunters, um, 
and they're a couple, have captured footage of a hooded, shadowy figure that they believe is the ghost of an ancient Egyptian priest haunting the museum where his mummy is kept. Um, And in this video, all of the ghost hunting equipment belonging to Sean Reynolds and Rebecca Palmer can be heard going off before a black shadow is seen walking in front of the camera and apparently into a tomb. Parents of three, Sean and Rebecca, were filming for their paranormal TV show at Leeds City Museum in March this year when the hooded apparition crossed their paths. Um, The museum holds the tomb of ancient Egyptian priest Nes Yamun, who died more than 3,000 years ago, and whose spirit, Sean believes, but that they encountered that night. Um, Sean from Liverpool, Merseyside, said that all the equipment was going crazy and that only happens if something sets off the alarms. It was Jane, our camera lady, who saw the shadow. We didn't see it at first, so we just had to trust that it would be there. Mm -hmm. And then when it came to editing the video, we were praying it wasn't just something she'd seen with her own eyes. And it was great to see we'd actually got it. And it's so clear. It is very clear. It is very clear. The top of the shadow is in the shape of a pointed hood and it walks straight into the tomb on the right. Um, So they definitely think it could be his spirit. And apparently the museum is meant to be quite active with reports of um, paranormal activity. So, yeah, um, Mm. I have had a look at the footage, which we again, we'll share it on our Facebook page so that you can have a look yourself. Um, Very interesting video um what did you think i did i mean there is no doubt that a shadow goes across the screen and into that room um i mean the only thing i would say is that at that moment the the people that you can see in the video don't seem to react to it so you think well maybe they went through the footage later and forgot that somebody had actually you know one of the crew had actually walked across the light but I mean, according to their report, somebody did yes. see it and they all looked at it. So, hey, Well, he's saying that he, the camera lady saw it and they yeah. didn't. Yeah. So she didn't react straight away. Maybe she mentioned it just after that yeah. footage ends, which would, which would stand, which would fit. But yeah, actually, I mean, it does. So if you're going to debunk it, I'd just say, well, that's just who was stood behind you. Yeah. I'd like, yeah. There's no footage of who was walking past. So it could very easily have just been another person in the team or the camera person themselves and their shadow. Um, but even without the shadow, all the, just the fact that all that equipment was going off yeah. is, is, is very interesting in itself, isn't it? It is. It is a very good clip. Um, yeah. I mean, if you were there and you know that it's true, that is, that's one of your best pieces of evidence, isn't it? It's, uh, you're not going to forget yeah. that moment. Exactly, exactly. And um, and in, in other para news, um, we can't really not mention the latest in the doll that um, the British team Ghosts of Britain have purchased the, the, the doll that was on this morning yes. TV that is, is reputed to be haunted. Um, it's gone to um, Ghosts of Britain... Um, team member Lee Steer's house and Mm -hmm. he's had it in his house now for more than a week well he's he's passed it on to a medium hasn't he he's now passed it on to a medium yes but before that happened um he was uh he's claimed that he was doing a live video Mm -hmm. and the live video um is him doing paranormal live streams that is what lee does um anyway and he's done this long long before he got the doll and apparently his dad was downstairs and his dad suffered a nasty scratch on his arm which replicates the same scratch that the previous owner had reported and believed that the doll has caused so Mm. seems like she's continuing her, her her reign of terror yeah uh all the feeds are up on if you look for Ghosts of Britain by Project Reveal on Facebook, yeah. you'll see all the latest, um, whatever your thoughts on this. It's, there's no no doubt that it's of great interest to many, many people. So, you know, make, uh, there's, there are so many opinions on this. And, you know, it gets quite heated as well because we, we're following a lot of the comments on various 
groups and pages and it certainly caused a stir whether yeah. you believe the dolls haunted or not um it's incredibly interesting so yeah and mm -hmm. i think i think what we would like to do we, we did say uh, when we did um when we did parapub without without daryl oh, yeah. um, we said we would ask daryl whitebottom our resident skeptic what his opinion on the haunted doll was yes um so how about we nip over now when we try and ring daryl yeah and get and we'll do skeptics view and get his opinion on that okay yep yeah. Skeptics view. Hello, is that Daryl Whitebottom? Hiya. Daryl, hi. Hi, welcome hi, to the show. Um, so, yeah, I hope you've been following the, the story about the doll that has been purchased on eBay by paranormal team Ghosts of Britain. Um, and we'd like to know what you make of this story, of the doll. Well, I was scratched by a doll once. Really? Oh, gosh. Oh, my goodness. So was, there, was it a haunted doll? This will be interesting. Yeah, gosh. No, no, it was nothing like that. Um, it were a few years back when I were a kid. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, my sister were at my Auntie Pat's, and she had one of them Barbie Dream Mansion houses, right? And I decided to um, get me Action Man to rob the place. I thought it was funny. And anyway, so she came home from Auntie Pat's and found Action Man hiding in wardrobe. And she went mad, so she made Barbie have a fight with him. Hmm. And, and so how did you end up getting scratched? That sounds crazy. <laughs> so, yeah, um, Action Man and Barbie ended up having a right proper scrap. It got really nasty. And I ended up, myself, not Action Man, with <laughs> a massive scratch all the way up my hand. And my mum had to take me to the doctors to get a load of them paper stitches done. Oh, gosh. <laughs> that sounds really nasty. Yeah, it doesn't sound very um, haunted, but, yeah, it does sound... No. Yeah, I know what siblings are like, so I can uh, sympathise <laughs> with you on that one, Daryl. What are you trying to say? At least I never, you never got an, into hospital because of me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, I've still got the scar I have. Oh, no. Oh dear. Mm. But um, what about Lee's doll, though? Do you think that's, you know, what, what's your opinion on that? I think I could have sold him my sister's Barbie for half the price. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, it, that's true. Your sister might have had to go along with the doll, though, to get the same uh, activity. Well, that's it. Do you, yeah, yeah. Do you think? Do you think it's haunted, though? I think it's probably safe to say it's um, probably an ox. <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling you'd say that, Daryl. I had a feeling you might say that, Daryl. But, you know, we needed to get your opinion. And, uh, and so thank you for that. That's, you know, he's a qualified, you're, you are a qualified parapsychologist. So thank you for your opinion, Daryl. And we will say goodbye for this week. Right, bye. Bye, Daryl. Bye, bye, Daryl. Yeah, I thought you might say that. Yeah. <laughs> He's always got a good story, though, hasn't he? He does. He does always have a good story. Yeah, but I, yeah. Uh, I, I've got a feeling there's going to be a lot more dolls up for sale on, on mm. eBay. Haunted dolls, I should say. Uh, <laughs> after this. <laughs> Um, I'll tell you what, how about we nip over and uh, find out who has been kicking off in mm -hmm. the paranormal world with Para Paddy. Yep, let's find out the drama. Who's having a Para Paddy this week? <laughs> okay, well, this week's rant has been from Lon Strickler. And um, Lon is the author of... Uh, phantoms and monsters uh, website and he is the guy that we have been following 
a lot of his latest updates and information on the Chicago phantom, like the, the Mothman creature that's yeah. being sighted all over um, Chicago, and it's still ongoing. Yeah. And if you've not updated yourself with that one, have a look now and pop over and have a look at his website and look at his the map, the interactive map of the latest sightings because it's not going away. Um, but he's had a rant uh, on Facebook, and he said on the 4th of August, he said, rant time yeah another one but this is important there is at least one well-known investigator who never shares research in brackets attempting to nab our chicago phantom research and call it their own Ooh. unfortunately there are several unscrupulous characters in the paranormal genre who are more concerned about notoriety and money be aware lon Mm. yeah well I, yeah it looks like somebody is trying to cash in on his research which yeah is, that's a shame that's not on at all no i, I find i find it crazy because uh, i mean i i don't really i don't really know long long strickler but i I know him he he's attached to this research it's so anyone who's been following it surely yeah couldn't. absolutely uh, I don't know how anyone can make out that they have done the research themselves, you know. I don't know. So there it's... you go. Yeah, that's uh, he's got a right to rant about that one. That's a bit yeah. crappy. That's right. And he's saying there's certain subscription-only websites uh, oh, that refuse okay. to share their information with the public without cost, mm. and that they simply have few scruples in his in his opinion. So, yeah. So there you go. It's. Yeah, it's similar. Uh, somebody commented uh, saying that several high-profile research investigators get these problems, and um, you know, it's 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 a tough one, isn't it? You you know, if you it are a, a researcher and you put your stuff out there, people will plagiarize yeah. it. So it's a shame, really, because you know we should we should be sharing knowledge because yes. the more we all know, the better as a mass we can um, evolve and, and develop and understand things. Exactly. But, um, yeah, you know, it, it's it's very common. I mean, I remember my partner, he went out to China to work in uh, a factory. He went for some meetings and that, and he said that the individuals that work in the factories, they don't give anything about what they do away because their right. knowledge of that job keeps their job. Right. So if mm. they show someone else what they're doing, they could they could be got rid of. So people wow. are, it, you know, it, it's it's a security in their knowledge. If I'm the only one that can do this, mm. that's going off on a tangent a bit anyway. But that's yeah, yeah. but it's relevant, isn't it? It's a shame yeah. really um, that people are, are becoming afraid yeah. to share knowledge because um, they're frightened that well, some if it, if it's well, it'll be. It's open to debate the minute you put it up there. Um, mm -hmm. So, for example, we've we've talked already about Lee and the doll. Well, you know, it's it's now out there. So, it, he, he's what he's doing essentially with this doll yeah. is research. Okay, so he's he's yeah, you know, it's been dubbed the haunted doll and all of this, but that's that's pretty much that's the media, isn't it? Yeah, the, the, that's what the media does to get sells it sells that kind of thing sells sells magazines and papers yeah. um lee's bought the doll to do research on it and he either debunks it or he'll prove uh either way or he's actually also offering it to the public to watch for themselves by having a locked off camera and like a live feed focused on the doll mm. and he's sending it out to other researchers like the medium so that they can give yeah. their opinion as well. So he's not going to claim all the information no. is his own, but no, it's, but it's also, open to. I mean, we're looking at we're, we're looking at a very um, superficial level of Lee's research. It could go a lot deeper. He could be thinking, right? I wonder, like the story of the Annabelle doll. It's absolutely mm -hmm. worldwide famous um, mm. and some people believe it because it's so famous he might have thought to himself one day i wonder if it's all hype i wonder mm. if i can recreate that hype myself yes. yeah and he, it could be as 
you know, it could be deeper. It could be, let's see if we can sensationalize an item and get pretty much the whole world believing it's haunted. That could be his research. Exactly. Well, have you ever heard of the Phillips experiment? No. Right. Well, so in the 1970s, um, and this is, this is putting me in mind of that, a group of Canadian parapsychologists wanted to attempt an experiment to see if they could create a ghost. Mm-hmm. And so that, that would, they had a theory that the human mind can produce spirit through expectation, imagination and visualization. Right. And this actual experiment took place in Toronto in Canada in 1972. So way before we were born, you know. Yeah. Uh, and it was under the direction of world-renowned expert on poltergeists, a Dr. A.R.G. Owen. And so the members of this experiment proposed this idea by that by using extreme and prolonged concentration, they could create a ghost through a collective th- thought form. Um, so non-physical entities which exist either in the mental or astral plane, in other words, uh, to, they, so they created a ghost and they made it as real as possible. They gave it a life story, a background, which they they even gave it a name. They said his name was Philip, so it's called the Philip experiment. And they created this tragic story about how he died, you know. Okay. And then they did some sittings. Um, and they did like seance. They dimmed the lights and sat around this table, and they, you know, they they had objects from the time period and around them and they they kept doing like Ouija boards and seances and right over a few weeks they, this this experiment continued and Philip eventually made contact with them so oh we know he, he didn't exist but right. he man he basically manifested in spiritual form um and he didn't act he didn't actually appear as an apparition but he did like he knocked on the table they got <gasps> knocks he answered questions that were consi- consistent with the fictitious history that they'd made up. So they asked him, like, how did you die and all of that. And it all fitted with what they knew they'd made up. Mm. Um, and he gave, he gave other historically accurate information about real events and people that would have been around at the time of his death or, be, you know, his life. So it took off from there and there was a lot of, phenomenon that couldn't be explained scientifically at all so they even at one point the table that they were doing the science on slid mm. from side to side and one on one occasion it actually chased someone across the room oh my god so in conclusion they were never able able to prove how it happened but right. it, basically you you what they have proved is that if you want something badly enough you can make it so i think you can in effect make that doll haunted because there are so many people wanting it to be yes yeah the power the power of belief and and the power of your mind yeah Mm. yeah it's an interesting one it's an interesting one so so you know what whatever people's thoughts are just bear bear that in mind as well because Mm. if, if activity starts to happen who knows what you know what what what's being created through sheer human yeah will you know Mm, very deep very deep but it's it just goes to show it's still research and it's still ongoing and if we all in the paranormal field want the answers just because this isn't something Conven- that's conventionally fitting with what you would like to do just just remember it's still research at the end of the it day is. it's still you know have a look at it from a, this different point of view and just yeah. w- watch with interest and don't don't dismiss somebody else's uh, angle that's what no. i say so you know i think that probably concludes this week's podcast um but thank you for tuning in we do appreciate all the support that we are getting for, for our little old podcast from wales and because uh, you know, we, somebody commented today on our podcast that has been has gone up on Conflict Official today. Uh, the interview we did with Paul Sinclair, mm-hmm. and and they commented that uh, the we're, we're amateur podcast and that the sound and the audio just is is not great. We we admit that because yeah. we we are uh, we're, we're indie podcasters. 
there's room for us as, as well. You've got the big yep. boys. and We do the best with what we've got. We do the best with what we've got. And the fact is we, we enjoy doing it. And if you do enjoy what we do, um, please, please do take a few moments to give us a five star rating on iTunes because it really helps mm. us. It helps the show and it helps it helps us doesn't it Lindsay um, yeah because you know we do it purely because we love the paranormal and uh, we love it if you tune in and listen to us and so we've only got seven reviews so far on iTunes <laughs> they are all five star I have to say uh, but please if you could take a few minutes to rate us it, it would give us a huge boost and um, before we do go just remember we've got a ghost story still to come after the final music uh, stay tuned for a true story from a North Wales asylum. So mm. until next week, uh, it's a goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. There's a certain Welsh village which has become world famous simply because of its name. A name which enables the village to boast one of the longest railway station signs in the world. Situated on the beautiful Isle of Anglesey, it is called Llanfair Cwrchwyn Geth Gogera Chwyrn Robo Llanty Silio Gogo Goch. This song will teach you how to say it. Llanfair Cwrchwyn Geth Gogera Chwyrn Robo Llanty Silio Gogo Goch. I hope our listener in... Uh... Minnesota's listening to this. <laughs> yeah. You know that Timothy Denise guy? Timothy Denise. Timothy Denise. Yeah. <laughs> it's especially for him. Cecilio go go go. Right. Brilliant. <laughs> right. Stay tuned now for a uh, bedtime story. I think we've just lost every listener we ever had. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'll leave that in or not. <laughs> The following story is taken from the book by Peter Glynn, titled Ghost Stories from the North Wales Asylum. Sick Ward Spectre. Death was no barrier. The year is 1981. I am on night duty at Hafan Ward, also known as Mail 8, also known as Sick Ward. The name Mail 8 was eventually dropped for political purposes as it had previously been called Number 8 in the asylum days. Hafan had now become a mixed ward for physically sick patients who were resident at the North Wales Hospital. There are 22 beds, 10 male, 10 female and two side rooms. I was there for three months and this is what happened. The time was just after 4am, the, the worst time for night nurse paralysis, which is a condition whereby all the senses are awake but the physical form is asleep. I was reading a book in the office, which is a glass room, that stood between the male and female sides of the ward. My colleague, a female nursing assistant was knitting. I was struggling to stay awake and had read the same page twice without noticing. The click clack of the needles was itself sleep inducing. My companion, M, suddenly stood up and looked over my head. She put her knitting down and said, John Edwards just got up and walked out onto the veranda. John Edward is his real name but I forget his surname. He was a chronic patient and he'd been in the care of the NWH before eventually being transferred as a patient to a satellite hospital, Pool Park, which is in the nearby town of Ruthin. John Edward had been admitted to Denby as a very young man 
and he'd been in the hospital over the decades. As he became less acute, he had been transferred to Paul Park. One charge nurse called it Harmless Hall because patients were burnt out and no longer a threat to either themselves or others. Sir John Edward was back now in Denby and he had been diagnosed with cancer. He was prescribed high doses of morphine, which was purely to see him protected from pain, which was constant. But John Edward was a total gentleman, and sad to say he was with us in Hafan to see out his final days. He was mobile, in other words, he could walk and sort himself out in the bathroom and toilet with minimum of supervision. And he was first in the queue at medication time the only evidence that he was in severe pain. After his medication, he'd toddle off to bed, get under the covers, and that'd be the last we'd see or hear of him during the night shift. Anyway, I was a little bit concerned that he would wander onto the veranda. And by now I was fully awake, so Em and I both came out of the office quick sharp and called, John, John. We trotted onto the veranda, which was in total blackness. The veranda was an addition to the ward proper. It was like a conservatory made up of windows just to facilitate sunlight, fresh air and convalescence. Warm in the summer, bitterly cold in the winter. In the old days, patients would be wheeled there and be able to receive nature's bounty whilst being under strict supervision. Those days were long gone though and it was now used more as a storeroom for books and chairs and spare beds and a few tables. It was certainly out of bounds at night, especially to a chronically sick schizophrenic on his last legs. So I clicked the light on and the veranda lit up. Me and herself looked in and suddenly it became more of a worry. John Edward was nowhere to be seen. I tried the veranda door and it was locked. He had entered the area, but he had not left. I stared at the nursing assistant. She had a puzzled look and I knew she had really seen John Edward get out of his bed and come into this enclosed part of sick ward. We now slowly walked back onto the male side and suddenly my colleague gasped. Look at this. She slowly pulled back the bedclothes and there lay John Edward in the fetal position, staring vacantly. I checked his breathing. I felt for a pulse. I looked up at Em and shook my head. John Edward was dead. We sprang into action. First I had to summon the duty doctor to pronounce death. Next, I informed the front office of the demise of the patient. The next phone call was to the porter's lodge to prepare transport to the morgue. I checked the notes for next of kin, but there were none. We awaited on the attention of the duty doctor, and once released, we went through the procedure of laying out the body. This involved stripping the body, laying it flat, removing anything artificial such as dentures and rings and then fully washing the body. I next stuffed the orifices with cotton wool, tied off the penis, tied the two big toes together, shaved the patient's face whilst M cut his nails. We dressed the patient in clean pyjamas brushed his hair and I replaced the dentures with the help of some petroleum jelly. John Edward's head now lay upon the pillow, his arms crossed upon his chest and he looked at peace. Satisfied, I pulled the sheet over his face. Joe, the night porter, arrived, coincidentally via the veranda, a hospital van being parked outside in front of the ECT department. After a period of banter, I assisted him with transferring the body from bed to trolley. Dead weight is a known expression. How very true. 
the dead body of my patient weighed more dead than when alive. My assistant, M, accompanied the night porter to the morgue, which is found just off the road to Bringolo, and then an admission ward for Cluid North. While she was there, I finished the paperwork and filled out the nursing notes. I had the death notice signed by Dr Patel, and the folder was now ready to be sent to medical records for process and storage. By the time M returned, morning was breaking. We now had duties to perform from 6am until 7.30am. We do a round, then we get the patients up into the chair, some dressed, some in nightwear. We have dressings to change. We assist with toileting of those who can, and we change those who cannot. Some urine bags needed emptying or replacing. Beds are stripped, and the charge nurse, Mr Egwin Jones, asked if we could give him and his team a start for when they come in at 7.25am, so we made up as many beds as we could. Our shift was done. It had been a busy and sad night. My colleague shed a tear on hand over us and some, after some comfort, we went our separate ways. Herself to the marital home and me to my room of loneliness. But sleep, oh yes, it came and it lasted until the alarm. We now had one more night of our four night shift and we arrived back on Hafan at 7.30pm for handover. Following our tasks and duties on taking charge of the ward, Em and I had an opportunity to talk about the incident that had been preying on both our minds but had remained unexplained. I pressed her for more details about what she had witnessed and just then the swing doors at the foot of the ward whooshed open. In strode the nursing officer George. He was still an impressive man at 60 years of age. Six, six foot tall, well built, not an ounce of fat on him. He had black, bushy hair and a ready smile. Mr Hughes, I said, come and listen to this. The NA started her account of what happened the previous night when she'd seen John through the office window. Well, I was knitting and I saw John Edward get out of bed. He was all right, you know. I carried on knitting, but then the next thing, he's rolling up his clothes and putting them under the mattress. He then walks onto the veranda. I told Pete, and we both got up to luck, didn't we? I concurred with her testimony. The old nightman nodded and frowned a little. He scratched at his black curly mop and said, Carry on. I continued with the story. Well, we couldn't find him in the veranda, but you know what, George? He was dead in bed. I don't know how it happened, but maybe he or... Well, I shook my head and looked at my feet. Don't worry, lad, I know what happened. You do? shouted Em and I at the same time. I've heard this sort of thing before, but I never believed it until now. George looked up at the ceiling and he sucked on his teeth a moment. He reached into his grey suit pocket and pulled out a packet of cigarettes. He tapped one out and lit it. Em and I stared at him, waiting for the night officer to finish his thoughts. He rolled up his clothes, you say? Em nodded. Well, that's the old action that hasn't been around for decades. Well, since I was first year back in the late forties. We continued to stare unsure of what to say. No, not heard of it. Well, after the alarm to get up in the morning, the patients would always roll their pyjamas up and place them under the mattress to keep them. And then at night, they'd keep their day clothes in the same way. George looked at his cigarette and continued. It was one of the routines. Everyone did it. Every morning for a week, then a month, then a year, then ten years, and then for every day of his or her life, and that's what you saw John Edwards doing. George took a shallow draw on his cigarette before t finishing his take on the matter. I was sure he wasn't a real smoker. 
when we became a hospital, that just all stopped because we gave them the clothes and the pyjamas to wear fresh every evening. I looked at M and M looked at me. The nursing officer said, that's what you saw. Yes, but George, it was a ghost. He burst out laughing. No, 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 it wasn't a ghost. He got past you, that's all, right? Any changes tonight, lad? Just then the phone rang, which broke the moment, and we all went back to whatever had to be done before lights out at 10pm. Em and I settled into the routine of the night shift. A patient to turn every 15 minutes and then around every hour before a brew, dinner breaks, and finally the dead hours between 3am and 4am. All was quiet and not a patient stirred. I had almost finished my book. I turned into the last chapter and shifted my position in the comfy chair. The steady click-clack of knitting needles was making me drowsy. Just then I noticed the silence. M had risen to her feet and her face a mask in the pale light. What she said turned my blood to ice. John Edward has just got up and walked out onto the veranda.